you tend to lose a little bit of focus on there are certain patterns that are lying in your patent portfolio which are really not uh, very relevant to the products that you sell anymore or even they are not even incorporated there. With this perspective, what happens, a lot of time there is a misalignment between uh, the patent portfolio, your innovation and your business uh, requirements. In uh, my last assignment, is there anybody from Hitachi, happens to be from Hitachi? No? Good, yeah. So, Hitachi has been one of the key innovators in terms of uh, CDs, DVDs, technologies. And of course, they had patents which were relevant. Of course, they rightfully owned that technology, a part of that technology. They came to my organization saying, you are manufacturing it, you are selling it across the globe, you are selling it to Walt Disney, you are selling it to Warner Brothers, and you need to license those patents out uh, from us. So fine, let's evaluate, let's see what you are saying, does it really make sense? We got down to analysis and results were a bit surprising. They have covered pretty much all technology, every small part of the technology, every geometry, every modulation, demodulation technique, everything in their patent portfolio. But for some reasons, their patent portfolio wasn't really optimized for licensing. And when I say that, a lot of their claims were something that could be interpreted either ways. If you are a licensor, you can interpret in some other way. I'm a licensee, I would pretty much interpret it in other way. And they were uh, pretty much open in the specifications also. And this is not the case with one patent, but pretty much the entire set of relevant patents that we zeroed on. Went, sat in front of them for discussion, face to face, you could really see, really read they, what, they, uh, what they are thinking. They are, even they are able to understand, okay, there's some, something that is really fishy and something can really go wrong here. Our proposal to them was, so we agree you have done a great job as far as technology is concerned, but the way we interpret your patent is very different from what you interpret. And you really cannot deny that. They also kind of agreed, okay, it could be interpreted in either ways. So if you license your technology to us, and if we go to the court, we don't want to license it out, your upside is you'll get, you'll add 10% of your entire licensing revenue that you are generating globally. And your risk is, if it is certainly in gray area, if we go to the court, it is interpreted in way that is negative for you, your downside is your entire licensing program globally would be finished. They ended up licensing us that portfolio for 1% of what they demanded. 1%. Not even usually patent trolls would do that. So not because their patent portfolio was bad, not because they were not mindful it, mindful for it, but probably their patent portfolio when it was built it had a different objective in mind. Licensing objective was probably not what they had at that point of time. They were not in that kind of a desperate situation, so they never really thought in that direction. So, yeah. So when we talk about creating value, we're essentially talking about, let's take a step back after a patent portfolio is made and then you try and license it out or then you try and figure out how do we create value by protecting your market share, gaining an access to the market. But whatever objective it is, it has to be prior to a filing of a patent, prior to building of a patent portfolio. Talk about a lot of good companies. In fact, Siemens does that. They have a lot of uh, area-specific innovation workshops. A certain area where technology is moving, industry is moving, Siemens wants to move. Probably that's the area where you need more innovation. That's an area where 
you need more focus. There, that's an area where you need more invention disclosures to be submitted. That's an area that needs to be protected more. So it, it is all in terms of what you want to achieve will define your purpose. Once you know this purpose, you know how to leverage it. And th that's the way it's easier to leverage or maximize the value. Imagine something in uh, automobile manufacturing. You would never give a target to a design team, manufacture a vehicle. The requirements would be manufacture a vehicle that a sitting space for four people that can probably travel on uh, bad roads, good fuel, fuel efficient. So there are certain targets, certain purpose, or certain target audience that, uh, that is in mind. If you don't have that, give this kind of a setup, you build a vehicle that costs less than uh, 5 lakhs or 10,000 grants. What will be the end result? It could be a bullock cart, it could be a rickshaw, it could be a jet plane, it could be something else. You really can't interchange their purpose. Coming on to the kind of objectives that we can have, the kind of purposes people can have. Uh, pretty much everything has been said about these parts already by my colleagues. Having said that, we'll talk about two or three key objectives that really can be in mind. Because if you have this objective in mind while innovation is being captured, innovation is being stimulated, before patent is being drafted or filed, you have a higher possibility of generating or creating value through your portfolio. For a small company, or even for a big company, you probably want to restore balance of power with your competition. You want to ensure that you are not, uh, you don't get into IP litigations, you don't have your markets blocked, market access blocked. So you really want, you want to make sure that you have free access to the market and the risk of IP litigation is minimized if not mitigated completely. To have this kind of a patent portfolio, to achieve this kind of an objective, you need a very different patent portfolio. You need, probably you don't need to protect, I mean, it's not completely exclusive, there would be some merger to it, but you probably don't need for this particular objective patents that cover your own products. That's always another part that could be sub part. But what you need to restore this kind of a balance is you want your competition to infringe your patent. You want your competition to use your patents. And to do, to do that, to have that kind of a portfolio, you want to improve upon competition's patents. You know, take a competition patent and say, can I improve it? And anything in this world can be improved. If we talk about uh, this kind of a balancing uh, happening, see, a lot, lot of times, a lot of companies, in fact, if I take an example, uh, China. China this year has become uh, highest patent filer in the world. Is it by chance? No. It is by design. Their objective is to reduce the revenue uh, royalty outflow for the entire country. Japan did it in uh, 80s. From they were, they were net uh, revenue giver country. Now they are not net revenue generator company uh, country in terms of royalty outflow. That's what China is trying to replicate. And that is what that organizations do. That is what organizations can also do. But you need a different sort of patent portfolio. You need a different mindset and you need a different uh, approach towards it. Another objective is, which a lot of people might really like, to generate money out of uh, patents, generate real hard cash through patents. You need a very, very different approach for that. You need to talk in terms of next generation of technology. You need to solve big problems of the world. 
in technology. You need to contribute to standards, you need to collaborate with people to make it happen. Uh, my friend Gaurav talk, talked about uh, Philips having a PNL uh, to their I, I, IP uh, department. Yes, and their major source of revenue is through licensing standard essential patents. You go to their website, they'll be, they have listed down their standard agreements, standard rates, and probably uh, 90 or 100 odd licensees already. They are master of this art. At one point of time, they had nobody closer to perfecting this part. Talk about claiming next generation technology. Shanghai, we have a lot of institutes, government associated institute. One of my uh, good friend, he leads one of those institute in Shanghai. It's a government supported institute. Their job is not to do a research to come out with a product. Their job is to read Apple's patent, read Samsung patent, read Siemens patent, come out with next generation of them, improve them, solve the problems that are there, and make sure the country's uh, royalty remains within the country. That's the next generation thing. Solving the big problems of next mm, generation technology, we are essentially here talking about small little startups, uh, figure out a small way of improving something, a big problem that has been uh, kind of preventing a lot of big companies to commercialize big technologies. I'll take an example. Uh, my time is up, so I'll take two minutes more. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, Asahi Glass, Asahi Glass Japan, for OLED displays, they have a special glass substrate wherein they try and extract uh, maximum light out of it. So today, to have a light extraction layer, to have it in a very periodic nanostructured way, you really have only one technology available that is lithography, that would involve lasers and all. So that makes it commercially pretty much unviable. Uh, there was a startup that figured out a way to replicate nanostructured periodic nano structured in a very controlled way. As I said, if you can give it us, give us this technology for uh, wherein the cost of using this technology is less than uh, $4.2 per square meter, at that point of time, their cost was more than $8. So we'll buy it from you. We'll buy this equipment from you. I said, fine, fair enough. Their internal cost was less than uh, $2. They went to Applied materials, they said we are ready with this technology, we have a ready customer. They went back to SI Glass, give us a PO, we'll give you this technology, we have demonstrated it in your labs. They gave us the PO, they went to applied materials. We have a technology ready which is patent protected, we have a customer ready who has given us a PO, we have a pilot, rail, pilot line ready, why don't you make a commercial line for it and sell it to the customer and give a certain percentage and replicate this model thereafter. They did. So it all boils down to the fact, until and unless we know where we want to go and what we want to do with our patent portfolio, it gets really difficult to create too much of value. You go to Terry and say, I have a patent portfolio of 200 patents and I want to license it out. He'll certainly be able to do that, mostly. But if, if, you, if you just say that I want to enter a certain market using this patent portfolio? I don't know, might be difficult. So the purpose is the key for value creation, which a lot of people do, which some of people in fact don't do. So that's where you talk about uh, the value creation, that's where it ends. And I'm sorry I've exceeded my time. <laughs>